You learn how to be a good drug dealer by experience. Nobody can teach you. And it's quite thrilling. Every cell in your body is, is trying to understand and, and, and be calm. And my reality was so far out there, I could not even function and got put in a psych ward. I was, you know, shackled, legs, arms, hands, put me in front of a grade school. And, and it really let me see of the bondage I was in. I knew I was being watched. And, you know, I had the DEA, the FBI, and the CIA all all around what I was doing. So my reputation started traveling back in Bolivia. Of, uh, we got a guy in, in, in the United States that he pays and, right. and we trust him. This is like the president of a country yeah. and one of our allies. And then Reagan yeah. sends in troops to arrest yeah. Noriega. And there's a huge gun battle. I would die before I would tell on him. I didn't get in trouble, I didn't get shot. I mean, my friend, friends were getting shot. I mean, I had no fear. Drove down, parked, and was walking in this alley, and there was a beautiful Bolivian, uh, it looked like a model. And, and I said, okay, this has got to be a setup. Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I'm here with Joe Tarsic. And we're going to be talking about his story. Um, can I say drug smuggler? Is that, uh, yeah, you, interstate you go, transportation is inter what I got, uh, uh, <laughs> or and not you know, or narcotics is what I got arrested for. But yeah, drug smuggler. Drug smuggler. Let's uh, go. Yeah, all the above. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, do you want to go with that? Yeah. Or is that is that good? Yeah, I think okay. yeah. <laughs> it's good. Okay. It's. I was gonna say I was gonna redo it, but yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, let's go with drug smuggler. Uh, well, it's funny, you know, it's like people say, you know, oh, you were arrested for mortgage fraud. Now it's bank fraud. Like, you uh, know, there is no uh, mortgage fraud. So yeah, same okay. thing. You're giving the technical name. But most people yeah. would just say smuggler. I, I One, I appreciate you coming out, yeah. obviously. Um, let's let's just start at the beginning. Like, you know, where were you born? Your parents, brothers, sisters, yeah. anything like uh, that? I, I was born in uh, Washington, D.C. I have two older sisters. Uh, dad was a military man. Uh, my mom was considered the debutante, and, uh, and we lived on uh, 17th and Upshur Street in Washington, D.C. until I was three. Um, you know, mil dad in the military didn't have a lot of money. Then we moved to uh, uh, Silver Spring in Maryland. Um, but, you know, coming from a, a, a house that had a maid, uh, was uh, my grandmother was one of the wealthiest uh, ladies in Washington, and her husband died when uh, she, I think he was 33, and my mom and the family lived with my grandmother before we moved out to Silver Spring. How, how old were you? I was three years old when we moved to Silver Spring, so that was... But your father was still in he, the military? He's still in the military, uh, didn't retire. He went on to, um, got out of the military, got a job, uh, when we were in Silver Spring, it was a very, the house cost them 15000 It was at an end of a dirt road. Uh, you know, they were they didn't have much money, and he was trying to support the family with that military income, which didn't work. And they were always fighting, and it was a, only a two-bedroom house. And um, my bedroom was in, I was actually stayed in a crib in my mother and dad's bedroom until I was almost six years old. My sisters lived in the other room in the house. How, very poor house, very poor at that time. How many sisters? You said Two sisters. So it's you and two sisters. Yeah, I mean, my dad came from a very uh, poor back background. His father was from Russia. They lived in upper state New York, never had running water. His dad went back to Russia when he was 15 years old. He joined the Navy to take care of his three brothers and his mother. Uh, it was just a real bad, uh, bad uh, scene. My grandfather could never speak English, and very he was from. He was a Russian Cossack, and very rough on my grandmother. All the stories were that he used to beat her. It was very dark, if you want to call it dark. So, so you went to high school. Yeah, yeah. Let me go back and just talk okay. about my grandmother's side. You know, uh, and my my mother's side was very wealthy, and it was like. Uh, Two, two opposites, my mother growing up very in a very wealthy family because of my grandfather, and we'll get down the road a little bit more about him. And then, you know, my father being very poor, uh, them trying to work together back in Maryland now, and now we're, I'm three years old in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland. And uh, at about age, uh, I guess third grade is, uh, 
I went to a little school right in that little neighborhood, and that's when they realized I had a problem with reading and writing, and that was when uh, really the, the, the challenges started in my life. Okay. You had uh, some kind of a learning disability? Yeah, uh, well, they call it dyslexia That's now. That's why I but, have dyslexia. But, but back then, there was no cure. Nobody knew. They thought there was something wrong. Yeah, you know, why the kid's a smart kid. Why can't he read and write? So that was yeah. kind so of my... Same thing. He's got a good vocabulary. He communicates well. Yeah. yeah. What's the problem? Yep. You know? Yep. Yeah. When I was a kid, I could take an engine apart and put it back together, but I couldn't read and write. So something, something was off. But... So that's kind of where it, it was when I was young. Um, you know, mom and dad didn't get along and continued to fight. And one traumatic uh, thing that happened when I was growing up, when my father uh, kind of grew up in that um, same thing, like his dad would yell and scream. You know, my mom would hold me when I was young when they would fight so my father wouldn't hit her. Right. So that's how I grew up for my first six years uh, from age Really, it started at age three to age six. And then the, um, you know, we were kind of in like a farmland back then. It was uh, not very uh, built up. And, uh, you know, I had nobody ever watching over me or, you know, when I went home, nobody said help him with his homework. Nobody, it was kind of like I was on my own because of all their problems. And then uh, at age seven, uh, I got went out to a barn and was playing with the kids and some older kids came out and the first time I got molested by a young man and that was uh, the reading and the molestation uh, was a traumatic and the way I brought up was brought up you know with the yelling and screaming kind of uh, turned me into a, a shell of a person and, and just not confident and really struggling just so socially in school and they sent me to a special school called Hillcrest in Washington. Uh, they had to borrow money from my grandmother, and that was a big deal. And it was an hour drive to the school and back home, and that's when all the arguing really started with, with my mother and father. And So that's where that out of line growing up, and, um, and that's where that kind of led to. Okay. So. Did you... Did you graduate from that school? I graduated from that school uh, and started learning more about my grandfather. And uh, as I was growing up, you know, my, my family would really, he really worship him. And, and um, you know, the money was still with my grandmother, even though it was years that he died. He, uh, um, and that in the book that I gave you, uh, there's a picture of the mansion he built on 16th Street. He was one of the richest uh, men in uh, DC, but he started smuggling liquor from Canada when he was uh, probably 20 years old. And his dad was the chief of police in Washington. So they were really, they were the little mob in Washington. Right. And, and that was, my grandmother had four daughters and my mother was the first one to have a boy. So they named me after my grandfather. So who was Joseph Marr and I was the first Joseph boy. So I was really looked at to uh, kind of hold the torch you know in my mind I was grown up to be like him and so that's how this all started forming those years of resentment and heading towards the, the problems with the drugs and how that ended up I, I really couldn't adjust to understanding about reading and writing and getting a regular job you know but high school was I had a lot of fun in high school right so did you I mean did like, did the reading get better, or did they just it, kind it, of... It got just... worse, and it didn't get any better. I went to the special school, and I, they still passed me. I uh, went to another special school in Wheaton. That's a little farther away, from about... Uh, and supposedly, I was making progress after the one in, Hill, in, in D.C. Uh, and then uh, when I got to seventh grade, uh, my sisters all graduated. My one sister was a homecoming queen, very prominent in the school and they the teachers seemed to like me but I still got put in a special class but in gym class I uh one of the football coaches recognized that I was pretty athletic and uh, so that was really my key to going through school without le ever learning how to read and write right so uh ended up uh lettering uh nine times uh football wrestling and track I was 
uh, athlete of the year in my senior class. Uh, to, to, they said I would be the most successful athlete. And that was a big thing in me. That I mean, I was a very introvert then. Uh, of course, the girls and the attraction of sports uh, led to a lot of fun. And uh, in, in my senior year, uh, I started smoking pot. And that was really the, the doorway. Uh, got a wrestling scholarship. Um, uh, to Montgomery College, they paid for my books, and that was, uh, you know, the first semester. Uh, my fear when I grew, when I got up in the morning, I, w I was so fearful of somebody calling on me and having to speak in front of anybody. Uh, it was like torment. And so after uh, after wrestling uh, class uh, or the season, I said, uh, um, I can't do this, and. Um, so I was working as a plumber uh, on the side. I actually started that when I was 16, like a summer job to get ready for sports, and it was hard work. And one of the guys in the neighborhood um, uh, uh, that I went to high school with was a really cool guy, had a brand new car, black guy, Afro. And, you know, I was in a shop class, and I used to wash his car and I'd drive it around the parking lot. So that was a big deal, but we became friends. And uh, actually, his brothers, who I'm visiting with right now, his little brother, um, uh, what, I, what was the uh, alfalfa and uh, what was the other guy? The, the uh, buckwheat, buckwheat and alfalfa. That's <laughs> that was our nicknames when we started the drugs. So, um, you know, we had a we really got along good. Like he was like the coolest hippiest guy you could ever imagine. Uh, but he got he got arrested uh, in my my first year out of high school, he got arrested for bank robbery. And What year uh, was this? That was 1972, I think he got arrested. I graduated in 1971. Okay. And, but we were friends since 10th grade, you know, even when I wasn't doing drugs, he was a cool guy. And um, it was another, him and another guy, uh, after I graduated from high school, a little bit of pot in, in you know, they had a party and, you know, I started doing cocaine. I tried cocaine and um, that, that became my best friend. Right. That made I, you feel what, I confident? Could, I could felt. be socially accepted everywhere I went when I had that cocaine. Yeah. And uh, that's where it really started. And, uh, you know, when I got to wrestling and, and left, I said, man, you know, I was, I was captain of the football team, captain of the wrestling team. Um, I had a gift, you know, and um, uh, I, I would... Even in sports, instead of telling people what to do, I would show them what to do. I would be a leader and example. Right. And so I think, when this is a perfect opportunity, I think I've been bred for this because of my grandfather. I said, okay, well, I started, first started getting high and just being a regular street dealer, you know, and, and then the cocaine became a little bit more important. And then I could see how I could take this bag of something and, and cut it a little bit and, and get my stash. And also uh, a lot of new friends. I thought they were friends at the time, right. but but uh, that was a way for me to feel like I was somebody. You know, I could feel confident because I had no confidence in sports. I had confidence, but that only lasts so long. You know, that that is a that's a real high. You know, the the, the feeling sports gives. It's 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 good for your body, and you know, but uh, I recognized I took all my trophies and everything, threw them in the trash and said, I know this isn't gonna be my future. But, so that's kind of where uh, it started before it got to the, where, where it ended, ended up. So how did, so how did, so that, that continued to just, you know, what, bloom and? Well, you know, uh, well, Dale was in jail and I. I um, how long did he get? He got, I think his first, I think it was three years and they sent him to a camp up in, um, uh, West Virginia, a uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. And, uh, you know, then we started doing some acid and, uh, you know, so I took some acid, drove up to West Virginia and had a visit with him. And I had some cigars, broke them down, put some cocaine in there and, you know, was bold enough to walk in there and give him that pack. And, you know, he got it and took it behind the bars and he got high. And But he, uh, while he was in jail, um, there was a guy and, and I'll just say his first name, Louis, uh, from New York, uh, and his dad was uh, uh, in the garment section in New York. He was the mafia garment section, uh, and they were selling heroin. 
So, um, of course, I had never done heroin, but Dale got this connection, and it was the, uh, I said, well, let's go. When he got out, I went up there to New York, I mean, up to West Virginia, drove him home, and we, we were tight. You know, we were brothers, and uh, and uh, it, we ended up going back to New York and, and visiting uh, East Houston Street. You know, here I'm a white guy and a black guy, and we're going to a Spanish Harlem or wherever that was, and, you know, two guys met us with guns, you know, off packing. He walked mm -hmm. us down the block. And then we uh, uh, got the OK on the first floor. And then, you know, every floor they had, they had guys sitting at the windows. And then when we got up to his room, you know, uh, his his dad, which was the guy. Uh, I'll just tell you this story. It's amazing. This, this makes me makes me think of uh, Frank Lucas from the American Gangster. Uh, yeah. Uh, Buried by the U.S. government and ignored by the national media. This is the story they don't want you to know. When Frank Amadeo met with President George W. Bush at the White House to discuss NATO operations in Afghanistan, no one knew that he'd already embezzled nearly $200 million from the federal government, money he intended to use to bankroll his plan to take over the world. From Amadeo's global headquarters in the shadow of Florida's Disney World, with a nearly inexhaustible supply of the Internal Revenue Services Fund, Amadeo acquired multiple businesses, amassing a mega conglomerate. Driven by his delusions of world conquest, he negotiated the purchase of a squadron of American fighter jets and the controlling interest in a former Soviet ICBM factory. He began work to build the largest private militia on the planet, over one million Africans strong. Simultaneously, Amadeo hired an international black ops force to orchestrate a coup in the Congo while plotting to take over several small Eastern European countries. The most disturbing part of it all is, had the US government not thwarted his plans, he might have just pulled it off. It's insanity. The bizarre, true story of a bipolar megalomaniac's insane plan for total world domination. Available now on Amazon and Audible. So anyway, we, we got in there, you know, and I, I was fearless. I don't know how, why, you know, uh, you know, but here we got a black guy and a white guy, and they could just put us in the, they could have thrown us in the river thinking we were trying to set him up because uh, Louis just got out of jail. Um, and then his dad drives up in a limousine, just like TV, white hair, comes in, and he wouldn't go upstairs until they got the okay that I was okay. Because they thought, you, you know, of course, everybody, if you're, if you're a drug dealer, you're looking at everybody. Everybody's gonna set yeah. you up. So, but they came upstairs, and that was the first time I ever did heroin. They chopped it up, showed us how to cut it. It was brown. You know, there's a formula they had. They, they uh, I forget how they mixed the drugs and and put it on the stove and cut cut the brown heroin. I think it was brown sugar or something. And and then you know I did a big line and. Uh, I, like I said, I never even did heroin before, and Dale did some. So by the time we got back to the train station, Dale could not even see. He couldn't hardly walk, and somehow the heroin didn't affect me like it did him. So I put the heroin in my sock, and uh, you know we left him in the train station. Uh, he was in there, took all his clothes off, and he was sweating so bad he couldn't see. He was blind. I said, "Okay, I gotta leave." So. I uh, got on the train and, you know, thinking we were going to get uh, a dog would be on the train. And, you know, so that was the first real big experience of a, of, of, of a mafia family and, and getting involved. And it's quite thrilling. You know, you're 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 at your peak of your of, you know, everything, every cell in your body is is trying to understand and, and, and be calm and go through. And so it got back home and that was the start of uh, where, where it continued to uh, grow, so. Okay, and I mean, how often did you make that trip or did you? Uh, well, that was the first trip. We went up, uh, we started, I didn't really, uh, after about six months, um, uh, I almost got busted. Uh, actually, another uh, undercover agent from uh, uh, Montgomery County, I actually grew up with since I was three years old. And uh, I went to sell, give somebody a, a stash of uh, heroin to see if they could, uh, if they could be somebody that we could sell it. And it was an old guy that was on the wrestling team and he got caught selling TVs and I didn't know he was trying to set me up. So this is the first time that I almost got arrested, but I didn't. And, and I knew 
for, why didn't I get arrested? I yeah, have no I, idea. So, I, so the, you know, I was supposed to meet this guy at McDonald's, and, and it just seems strange to me. This is where you learn how to, you learn how to be a good drug dealer by experience. Nobody can teach you. So, so I, I met this, I was going to McDonald's. I, I, can, I can remember all this stuff like it's yesterday. But uh, so I walked in McDonald's and I, I just felt so funny and I saw a black car and I said, something's not right. So I left McDonald's and, um, and I, I w the next day I was over at a friend's, another wrestler's house in, in uh, uh, Aspen Hill. And uh, I walked in and he says, oh yeah, that, he was kind of joking with me about being paranoid. And he says, that guy, I got an undercover cop that lives right over there and I saw that exact car that I, the night before or the evening before I was supposed to meet, I saw that one at McDonald's. So I realized that the undercover cop is the guy that I left the meeting. And that kind of, uh, kind of blew my mind that this guy would try to set me up. And this is my first heroin transaction. I almost got busted. Right. So with all that said, we started meeting. Uh, Louie came down from Maryland. They had another buy in our apartment. That I, I got an apartment with that guy, Dale. Uh, and um, um, the uh, Montgomery County our Narcotics Squad asked me to come in, and oh, they wanted to interview me. And uh, I went to my buddy. For a job? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I went to my buddy. My uh, The guy that I grew up with was undercover, and he kind of coached me. On, man, he says, they don't have you, but if you say something, because they knew Dale was a, a bank robber, and he, Dale had been dealing for years, so they knew that we lived together. Right. And, and he says, they, he, they have nothing on you, but if you don't say anything, because they usually don't, you know, usually people- You usually give them yeah, enough information yeah, to yeah, hang yeah. you. Right. Yeah, that's why they're interviewing you. If they had enough to hang you, they wouldn't be calling you in to talk to you. Right. So anyway, I went through that experience and uh, realized, uh, um, you know, how to work through a situation with the police on me and getting back out. And you know, you go through traumatic pressure through all this, I'm sure you yeah. understand that. And uh, so that was the first time I got out of there, uh, you know, moved out of the apartment with Dale, um, and then uh, got into uh, trying to quit, I tried to quit dealing and that lasted about a week. So, uh, and, and so that, that, didn't that was- Didn't take, you, you gave it a long yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a week is about all it would last. So that, that, was, that was my first experience with almost getting busted in the New York and really uh, building a bond with Dale in his boldness. You know, he's a pretty bold guy. You know, there's certain things you gotta be to be a good drug dealer and it's pretty bold. Yeah. You, know, I, we were, you know, back then it was more of a thrill. It wasn't to shoot him up everything like it's become today right so, so how how long did this go on before um well the i then i really i, I found a couple people in town that were uh, uh selling cocaine and uh went through uh, um uh, learning about cocaine you know that was the biggest thing is because everybody's got the best so you had to learn the quality and and i started dealing and um the next trip I took was uh, I drove out to California with a friend just for for fun, and uh, I ran into a group there that um, was ha had the best cocaine I ever did. I've only been doing cocaine for a couple of years, but this is about 1975. So about four years I had been doing uh, cocaine in the area as and de dealing with it the best I could as a small time because I was at the bottom of the chain instead of the top of the chain. Right. And um, so I went out to uh, L.A. and I found this cocaine that I never, it was just really good. And so came back home. I started dating a girl that her mom owned a head shop. Her brother was one of the, probably the second biggest bookie in the area. And I became friends. I mean, some of these, uh, some of the guys like bookies and everything back then were just characters, just fun to be around right. and, and just... Uh, uh, you know, attracted everybody. You know, they were the, the life of the party kind of people. Uh, and I borrowed $8,000 from him. I said, listen, uh, and he, I was selling him pot. He loved to smoke pot. So uh, I said, um, so I took that 8,000, got, got on a plane, went to San Francisco uh, and 
my buddy that I went with, you know, we they, they started, oh, we got the cocaine, but we ran out of that. And then we went on this trail all around town and never could get a sample. And, and then they waited until we were get, just getting ready to get on the airplane. They said, oh, we found it. So we got it, wasn't even able to try it or anything. And, uh, uh, you know, put it, we had a banjo. We put it in the back of the banjo, put it on the plane, came home and got ripped off. You know, it was yeah. garbage. And that was my big lesson. Uh, you know, I thought, oh man, these guys are gonna shoot me. I'm, I'm not gonna have the money to pay them. I think I got back $2,000 out of some bogus cocaine that I tried to sell. So that was my second big lesson, so. What kind of money were you, I mean, making in general? Just so uh, That was just, uh, that was really support and habit right. right then. That wasn't the money. Um, and then I, you know, it, it's, it's, if you want me to keep telling you the process of, you know, and then I've met a guy in, in Bethesda that uh, uh, about uh, 50 miles out of town in Front Royal, um, I went out there and, you know, he was getting a, a, a cocaine from Bolivia. He had a, a way that they were sending it to him in the mail. And that's where I really learned what quality was. And, right. And that was another big lesson, you know, uh, um, with Dale and the people we were around, how people really abused uh, the power of having drugs and, and manipulating people around. And then the girls and uh, got involved with some of the Redskins. Uh, that was another mafia group that was not as, not as big as they thought they were, but... Um, that was really what are uh, the Redskins? Oh, football team. Oh, okay, the, the no, NFL. I, that's what I thought. Yeah, but you yeah, still, yeah, you said, then you said yeah, kind yeah, of a mafia. Yeah, but. yeah. Well, it was who was around some of the guys that played. Okay, you know, and that's where I, I got it, uh, my taste of what that was, and and then how the girl, well, my girlfriend that I used to uh, have a girlfriend that we stayed friends. She became friends, or uh, supposedly getting married with one of the Redskins, and. They had a kid, and, and that was another whole process of learning uh, the, the manipulation and how people use people when they have drugs. And so that was kind of hard because of how they treated women. It was, uh, I don't know if people know the other side of the sports and how women get treated, but it's pretty, uh, it's pretty, I don't know how you want to put it. Egregious? But it, yeah. Yeah, so that really stunned me. And uh, so, so I learned uh, a little bit from this guy in Front Royal, and then we had the Redskins. And then there was a lady, a, a friend of mine, that, the guy that turned me on to cocaine, uh, you know, his brother had a maid from Bolivia, and she said she knew somebody. And so his brother started getting some real good product, but he only did a couple ounces. And, you know, my goal was to, start a family you know because right. after all the stuff i had been through and you know the police and you know all the stuff I, I said man i got and then i got uh uh through the traumatic experience when i went out to uh virginia my girlfriend started s sleeping with this guy that had the best cocaine and that just tore me up and i, I with that pressure and what I've been through and the police kind of starting to watch me, I, I had a nervous breakdown. You know, my reality was so far out there, I could not even function and got put in a psych ward. So I was in a psych ward in 1976. And that was, uh, you know, how could I fit in the world? And, you know, what, what, was, what was life about? You know, what, was, what, what does this all mean? You know, you know, trying to figure my purpose out. I was just going to say, you didn't really have a purpose. Yeah, I was just... You were just kind of existing? Uh, yeah, yeah, and, you know, but I knew there was something, you know, my grandfather, you know, how could I make this be something that I really enjoyed? What was this about? What, what was my niche in all this? And, and I didn't want to be used and underneath these guys that had the families and how they were abusing people, you know, so I thought I could do it better than them. Right. And, and now, uh, you know, uh, and that that uh, that experience came back out. Of, I was there for uh, two weeks. Where? In uh, Springfield State Hospital. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, and then uh, I said, tried to get a job. You know, I said, okay, I'm going to quit dealing. My dad uh, drove me. I was up near BWI Airport in Baltimore. He drove me to a job interview, and I walked in this building. And they gave me some papers to fill out, and I couldn't even write down my name and address and what I could do. 
And I kind of folded the papers up, set them on the table, and walked out. And I said, okay, I know what I got to do. Did you so, jump on a plane to Bolivia? And, well, now it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was, but uh, yeah, that was the start of, of, of just feeling that I didn't fit. You know, what was, what, you know, just couldn't adjust uh, with the pain and the things I was traveling with in my life uh, is just a ball of confusion. And where, where, where could I get my, my spot, if you want to call it, that I was going to be successful? Mm. So, but that was the start of where it ended up. So the, the guy that was, uh, that turned me on to cocaine and we did some business, um, so we had, I was, as this was going on, I was building my little empire of understanding how to function among these, all the criminals. I was a criminal too, but you right. know, I didn't look at myself as a criminal, yeah. but I was too. Uh, and so I got that, uh, that connection and this girl, um, I, I finally, he convinced his brother to give us her telephone number. She was from Bolivia. So she called up one night. She says, okay, I'm gonna, this is me and my buddy. He said, I'm gonna meet you in Georgetown. And she gave us an address and it was, in the, in the, and it was an alley. And it was about 12 o'clock at night. And I didn't know if this was the final hit. They finally set me up. And, uh, Cause you never know who's, who's doing what in, this, in the world. And uh, so we drove down to, uh, uh, that was about an hour's drive from where we lived drove down, parked, and was walking in this alley, and there was a beautiful Bolivian, uh, it looked like a model. And, and I said, okay, this has gotta be a setup. This can't be real. And she broke in English, beautiful accent. You know, you, you would dream about meeting somebody like this. And um, she gave me a bag, and she says, okay, this is what you're gonna do. Uh, you sell this, I'm gonna meet you back in two weeks. Uh, you guys give me the money. So that's how it started. And I think, I think we got, when we first started, it was just about five ounces, not a, not a bunch. But I, I hustled, got the money, gave her the money. So I did, I did work with her for about five years. And then her boss. That same process? Just yeah, the, same the process. Not Well, it would be meeting different places. I met her in front of the airport. She'd walk out of the airport, give us, I had, my, I had, a, I had a Doberman. I had a, a van, a, a big tank of water in the, yeah, I, driving up to the airport is not the smart thing to do. Cause you know, you, you never want to get blocked in. Your drug dealer, you learn how to do things a little right. safe. But she had the boldness, it's like she had a license to do what she did. She walked out of the airport, Got in the van, gave us, I think, a, a pound, a pound, that's how we started, and, and got back out, and she said, I'll see you in, in about a month. A pound of what? Cocaine, Coke. yeah, yeah. And I mean, when I say cocaine, it was as good as you could imagine. They don't, anything that goes through the mob and came in, nothing was like this. It was, uh, I think they charged me uh, like $1,000 an ounce, and. The market for that, without cutting it, was uh, about 2000 at that time. And then if you cut it a little bit, which I was very, uh, I wanted to build a market, I wanted the best in town, and that's where I started my market. If, if, you know, if I was gonna build what I was trying to build, I needed the best product. Right. And so I've been, what, uh, almost five years of, you know, being, uh, getting a bunch of garbage, and once in a while you get something that was good, but they, to get, the, you know, that's where you, I could build what I was trying to build. So um, you're still, what, what kind of money are you still making now? I mean, are, are uh, you, do, you doing know, decent? Or? Yeah, yeah, you know, I was making, uh, I would say we would make between 15 and 20,000. And that time it was pretty, not, that's a, that's it was a pretty a, good market. And, and you know, I, it would take me a week to do that. You know, and then uh, her boss uh, understood, so my reputation started traveling back in Bolivia. Of uh, we got a guy in, in in the United States that he pays, and, right. and we trust him. So that's how that's how that. And then his her boss uh, came to the United States. And are you are, I mean, 
I mean, before we get to that, like, are you, are people around you getting busted or anything? Or it's, there's just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, in, in the meantime, uh, uh, when she wasn't around, because that would last, there was no, I had no idea when she was coming and when she wasn't coming. And there was times when it would be three or four months that she wouldn't disappear. She, I had no telephone number. She did, the only thing she had was my number. Right. I had no control of when she would show up. So in the meantime, I said, well, I got to do something. I got tired of waiting. And then I wanted to go down to Florida and because uh, that's where the action was. And my uncle was a bartender. And uh, he was kind of the, the guy that was my idol when I grew up. He, he had a brand new Cadillac every year, come down, had you know the trunk full of Playboys, lifted weights, had a tattoo. You know, uh, the model, that's who I modeled myself. My father and I didn't get along and you know that family stuff was a mess. And so that was the guy that you know showed me how to work on engines. I mean, he was he was like a, the king for me, and uh, he was a bartender down there. He was alcoholic, uh, but he he and Barry, which uh, I mentioned to you, he they were buddies. They went treasure hunting in South America. They were like the real wild. They were the real deal. And uh, my uncle had been uh, arrested and, and arrested in South America for gun smuggling. So that's what he did when they weren't, they were all mixed with guns. They were a different, they were the old time guys. Uh, right. Barry and this uh, CIA agent that I'll uh, get to later in the story used to be uh, Dean Martin's and uh, Frank Sinatra's captain on their boat. So the guy Barry, uh, uh, which I'll share more about, he's, he and I became friends. And uh, he didn't use coke, he was a drinker. But he could speak uh, Spanish, so I needed a translator to get to this next step that I was about ready to take. So I started uh, dealing a little bit of drugs for the cocaine cowboys that was in Fort Lauderdale. So uh, I went down there and he introduced me to them and they took me under their wing, they liked me, you know, gave me a car when I came down there. It was pretty, pretty wild. They were really wild, but they were they they were the kind of guys that would use you and then set you up. So when they get in trouble, that's how they kept their market going. Right. They, they would build a clientele and then they would set people up, and the people that were working with them would let them continue to deal. So there was some big lawyers involved, the big money, real big money. So. Okay. The big money, the money that I started making started when I got in touch with uh, that gentleman. I gave you that picture. Right. Um, this is uh, Barry Seal, the movie. Yeah. Um, uh, American Made. American Made. The, the guy that they made that movie about Barry, uh, one of the guys, uh, and I met the pilots uh, from Barry. They were. Uh, I mentioned that CIA airport, that was all set up by the CIA and they let them use the airport. And then when they decided to close them, I guess they were, as they did that, the CIA, they were setting up, they were infiltrating all the, the market that they wanted to. So when they got finished with them, they, they arrested them all. This is the real story. Right. And then they had a judge, I think it was North Carolina, South Carolina, they had a judge so Barry and his partner, the judge, the the um, the pilots all went to prison. They I think they got like five years the, in the in the movie, and then Barry and his partner, they made them get all the money and they came in the courtroom. Barry told me he says we had gar um, you know trash bags full of money, and the judge made them give them all the money and sent them out. So it was all about the money sifting right. and getting in the right hands. You know we know what we know about that. I was going to say, um, yeah, I had seen the movie when they made it back in the 80s. It yeah. was on like HBO. And this was when, um, yep. who was the, the, I forget the guy, like Tom Cruise played the the, the remake. Mm. But um, I forget, Dennis Hopper. Oh, really? Paid, I didn't. Paid Barry, played Barry Seal. Okay. And okay. I always remember, um, you know, the end of that movie where they sent him, where the, they, sentenced him to the halfway house like you have you can mm. you can work but you have to be at the halfway house every night and he says he says in that one he says to the judge what are you talking about like if you make me go to the you're just yeah. they'll just kill me in the halfway house yeah, yeah. and he's doing the judge is like <laughs> get out of here you're fun you're getting a deal and sure enough they they kill him in the halfway house yeah pulls up and they're yeah. waiting for him yeah um so so what what so at, at what point 
at what point do you end up going to like do you start importing stuff from well um so as i was working with barry and uh, you know getting this ex- experience and uh, um um I'm trying to think if there was, when when the law. Um, of course, I was best friends with a guy in D.C. that was uh, uh, like a mafia family. He had a, uh, a strip club and different clubs. He he was uh, my grandfather and his father were friends. So I, I the people I was around uh, and my record and the DEA and. Um, we're, we're right close, and now uh, Barry and the guy that set up Barry, um, which we found out was the old guy from the captain when they used to captain um, uh, Frank Sinatra's boat. He was in the CIA, and at that time, I didn't know what his part was, and so we needed somebody to fly a shipment to from Florida to me, and they used him to do that. And then right before he flew back. They told me that he just busted, I think it was uh, a plane from uh, Columbia. Uh, there must have been a, a ton of cocaine. And he was the guy that they used. And we didn't know it at the time, but we'd already set up him flying cocaine to me. I mean, the CIA, you know, they work inside. I mean, this is, they 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 have a cover that lasts for years. And, and so I have a guy coming uh, to Maryland from Barry's f- sending him bringing a shipment from the cocaine cowboys and he's a CIA agent and here I am uh you know he they kind of knew I was working with this Bolivian group and my boss was best friends with the guy Noriega and that's when they were trying to get the evidence for Noriega and right. before they were setting him up so I, I couldn't tell who I was with when 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 this thing started rolling with my new boss, the guy that uh, came from Bolivia, when it came in, it went to the police in Miami. I would go down with Barry, and they would give it to Barry to give to me. So it got so difficult to know who side I was really on. And that's kind of where I was at with starting my, my relationship with the guy in Bolivia. And uh, that's, does that make, is it making sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was thinking about, um, I was just wondering to myself, uh, when we said Noriega, I was wondering if Colby knew who Manuel Noriega was. Oh. No. (laughs) (laughs) Well, he was a, a, a it was a Panama, right? Yeah, it was Panama. He He was was the the president president of Panama. Yeah, that was when the big cartel was really had control of the money. Uh, The people that were really involved were him and some people, you know, there, it was a select flu- a few that was friends with him that were covered uh, in many ways. And uh, they- Oh, I'm sorry. They, go they wanted me to meet him, and but I was afraid to, and Barry met him in Miami. They were pulling me even closer, and I said, nope, I'm not, I'm not gonna get that close. So, I mean, this is the president of, you know, Panama, you know, the Panama Canal, you know, Panama, like um, in Central uh, America, and, He's running, he's running drugs. He's letting yeah. drugs yeah. get run through yeah. the company, and I mean through the company, through the country, and yeah. eventually, uh, you know, and they're buying, they're selling uh, drugs to get money to buy arms yeah. for the Contras. For this, it was a, um, yeah. a, a a a militant group that was trying to uh, overthrow. Um, what were they trying to overthrow? Was it uh, I, I, Colombia? Uh, yeah, I don't know if it was one of the one of those countries. Then I don't know yeah, the whole the detail. So they're trying to overthrow like the like a communist regime yeah. or something, and they're yeah. you know I mean it was a complete you know complete clusterfuck. Like it was just yeah. completely just. But but the CIA is actively working with them yeah. to get the money because Congress they couldn't get money from Congress yeah. to fund these guys for this revolution. So what do they do? They start working with these guys in Panama and letting them and and, and selling drugs, letting yeah. the drugs go in and out to get the money to buy the guns. Yeah, and it's just it's just it's it's ridiculous. But this is like the president of a country. Yeah, and one of our allies, and then Reagan, yeah, sends in troops to yeah. arrest Noriega. Yeah, like because I mean, how how do you say? Hey, you've been indicted. Like it's like saying, it's like saying Xi Jinping has been indicted. Um, 
we need you guys to hand them over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's not going to yeah. happen. Yeah. So they send in American troops to arrest. Yeah. And there's a huge gun battle. I mean, this oh, goes yeah, this on is, like all uh, like for is, like a day or two. Yeah, this was. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, and then it's I, covered up. There's like I problems. think it got too close to getting the truth out and what there was really going on, and they uh, they shut it down. Yeah. Then Ronald Reagan gets pulled in yeah. in front of Congress, yeah. and he can't remember nothing. Yeah. He's there like, yeah, I don't. <laughs> I, I I think he had about thirty different ways to say, I don't recall. Yeah. It was. You know, yeah. at this time, I don't presently recall what happened. At, you know, I'm not sure. I would have to check with yeah. my so-and-so. At that time, I believe yeah. that I cannot recall exactly what happened. Yeah. I mean, it was it was like, this is amazing. Yeah. It, it was like watching um, Bill Clinton give those answers. Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah. did he just, like, how are your side, like, you're a professional sidestepper. Yeah. Like, it, it almost, I almost feel like you answered the question. You didn't, but I almost <laughs> feel like you did. You're so good at it. And that, yeah, that was the the yeah. Iran Contra whole affair. But yeah. yeah, it was all these guys were just involved, yeah. and and yeah. the government's involved, and that's yeah, it's kind of like the um, Fast and Furious, where they're 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 pulling guns, yeah. you know, from drug dealers and selling them to yeah. the uh, to the cartel. Like it's it's insane. It's a, what are you doing? This is the yeah. DE ATF and DEA yeah. you know, that are yeah. involved in this. Like that, yeah. you're not supposed to be doing those things. Yeah, they did some stuff that they don't. Not supposed to do. So. You gotta see that movie. You have to see the movie. Yeah. They don't do. Listen, they don't do nearly as good of a job in the Tom Cruise one. Oh, really? I didn't see the first. You the had, the, the okay. first one is I better because okay. you have a full understanding that, yeah. like, this is clearly. Yeah. This is what's happening. Yeah. It's hard to follow yeah. in the Tom Cruise one. It's more flash and. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a good movie. Yeah. Yeah. But these guys are, uh, you know, and uh, all these. People are really unique and in individuals. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, they just chose this other side of the street, and uh, so it's. Well, it's funny you don't you you never really get like a, a super average normal guy, you know, in like the drug people yeah. criminals are they extreme personalities. Yes, you're right. You know, yeah, they're either they're, they're mo- uh, 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 there's so much talent sitting behind bars. It's amazing. I'll just say that. Yeah. You know, if they could ever understand how to find the life that they could be successful with, like you have been, and um, I'll, I'll tell a little bit more about where I came. But but there's a ton of talent sitting behind bars. I'll yeah. just say that. Yeah, it's sad. So what? Ha- so at some point you you say, hey, I'm just going to start shipping this and stuff in well, from you, Bolivia. So then, uh, you know, I started working with uh, my boss. Of, or, you know, they, they brought me down to Bolivia, uh, invited me to come visit. Uh, you know, and at that time, you know, I was a pretty business type guy, you know, silk suits and, uh, you know. That's and, the picture, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I enjoyed having money. Um, and, you know, I, I, I guess the... the at that time, I guess a, a big shipment was about 10 keys for me. And, uh, you know, my habit was uh, way, way, uh, I was drinking about a fifth of, uh, uh, um, uh, what's, uh, what's my, my drink with the, the blue case? Um, Crown Royal. <laughs> Crown Royal. It's been so long. It's been 37 years since. But, you know, I was probably drinking a, a fifth of Crown Royal almost a day. And, and, and smoking pot and, and getting high, you know, because, you know, I had the DEA, the FBI, and the CIA all, all around what I was doing. And I got pulled out of the airport. Uh, that, that shipment that that CIA guy brought, uh, I left Florida and stuck about a gram in my pocket because I knew I was being watched. I, I wouldn't travel. I was smart enough not to travel and, and, and move it myself. Right. Because that's when... Uh, you know, I didn't want to jeopardize. I knew I was being watched, and they pulled me out. Uh, and that was Ronald Reagan Airport. I walked outside, was getting in the cab, and a lady looked like a grandmother. F- flipped a badge, uh, DEA. She said, "Son, son, come on, we're going to talk to you." You know, pulled me out of there, <laughs> took me down in the, in a basement. And, you know, I was making excuses. Oh, my, my, my uncle's uh, an alcoholic, and I had to go to Florida to help him. And uh, they, were, they went through my collar, and, my, and I've had some real thick socks on. And, uh, and, and I had a gram in there, and they went down my legs and missed it. And uh, I was sweating. But, but um, 
that that really uh you know and then i knew that was the day before the guy from the cia was shipping coming flying in and i think they thought they had me and they didn't and they didn't blow his cover and uh you know i had like three or four different places in in maryland one was in annapolis i had different places i was hiding everything you know and, and moving it around because uh that was the only thing i knew is just stay ahead of everybody so so that was um that was the start and then after that uh, then we started, I got invited down to, uh, got through that, and that was with Cocaine Cowboys. I was doing a little bit with a, a, Boliv a, a Cuban mafia in the Keys. They were big pot smugglers, uh, and that was real bad cocaine. I worked with them for a while, and, and that wasn't, that wasn't good because you'd get a batch and then you'd have a hard time selling it and then they would be back up in Maryland kind of threatening me, you know, what are you going to do? And I had to, uh, I didn't, some of the money, uh, they had shipped something in that they smuggled it in diesel and it smelled like it was horrible. So anyway, I lost money on that and I gave them a sports car I had built to, to pay them off, to, to make them happy. And, um, and then going to Bolivia with my boss, uh, you know, I was, they, it, it was, I was treated, um, you know, I would die before I would tell on them. I, I wouldn't, um, uh, it was family. They trusted me. And, uh, you know, you know, you go through a life of drug and then you get to a place that people really cared and, and trusted you. And I couldn't, even when I got arrested, they tried to get me to set them up. And I, uh, I didn't, uh, I said, you know, if I did the crime, I was going to do the time. Um, and that's another part of the story that's coming up, uh, that, uh, getting pulled over. Uh, but so let me, let me, let me take the story this way. Um, so I was at the edge, of, you know, my boss was in New York uh, and he got pulled over. This is right nor right before Noriega got arrested. And I believe he was used by our government to get what they needed to set up the uh, the invasion that they had for him. Right. And I was just on the outside of that. And, and um, I think I was watched as I was dealing and, and they were using it also to kind of corner him, but for somehow I did not get arrested. It was beyond my understanding that what I was doing, I didn't get stopped. And, and but, you know, um, so I tried to, when he got, when, when there was about six months where I couldn't get in touch with him and I said, I got to get out or I know I'm going to do big time. I know I, I'm going to be dead or I'm going to, I'm going to do big time. So I said, I'm going to open a recording studio. And in, in the recording studio, I said, well, this is one way I'll be able to support my habit and, and not have to deal because, you know, I was, I, I had a huge monster habit of cocaine. Uh, you know, you get used to spending money and you, it's hard not to, to change unless, you're, unless you change your whole life. It's hard to get out of whatever you're doing right. when you get used to money. And you probably know that right. better than I do. <laughs> But, but so, so I opened up a recording, I took the money, I had a, a, the last trip, I, I had about 20 ounces and about $40,000. And um, I, I said, okay, I'm gonna take that aside, I'm gonna build a recording studio and I'm gonna somehow get a hit record because I, I said, that's just the only way I'm ever gonna get out. Um, so I, I, another friend that I'm still friends with, uh, you know, I had a piece of property, um, my father left my family left and I was trying to buy it from them. Had a garage that I used to have a carpet company when I was uh, trying to, you know, keep things undercover. I had a little company I was running. So anyway, I, I remodeled that building and, and built a, re a recording studio. So in about a, a year after I got it all put together, um, um, it was almost like I was blessed I, I, for somehow, uh, you know, I, I was, and I, talk, I, I was kind of on the side of a uh, demonic side or Satan's world. I'm, I'm just kind of give this in spiritual terms. Okay. I was kind of able to move in darkness without anybody stopping me. Uh, you know, the blessings, uh, I call them worldly blessings of, you know, meeting that girl and how I got, didn't get in trouble. I didn't get shot. I mean, my friend, friends were getting shot. I was, in the, I was in some rough places in D.C. I mean, I had no fear. I don't know, what, you know what protected me. But anyway, got through all that. Um, and uh, this recording studio. So I, I was 
this guy that had done three albums with Warner Brothers. Um, unbelievable. Uh, I, I'm not going to mention his name because he still has a company, he's still uh, doing his thing. Um, but he was a cult. It was a cult. Uh, he had six wives and 21 kids at the time. And he was, uh, he was my age. How old was I? I was 30, 33 years old. And uh, Warner Brothers blackballed him. He had articles in Playboy and um, unbelievable uh, Stevie Wonder, uh, James Brown type of uh, uh, charisma. You know, uh, just an a unbelievable uh, a magnetic man, a black man that uh, had all the talent in the world, but the industry was scared of him because of what he believed in and they, they shut him down. And he was looking for a guy that had a studio and money, and of course it was me. Right. So when we got together, it was like, we fit like a glove, you know? It was like, uh, I wanted to be successful to, to continue my lifestyle, and he needed somebody like me to back him that wasn't afraid of the industry or, you know? So we started an album, um, and that album uh, took us about two years, and I was at that time I had no un understanding of what it took to produce a hit record. So he taught me, and I mean it was drooling the time we spent in the studio and what he did with all the musicians. I mean, oh, I mean when you say cutting a groove, years ago when they cut a groove, they worked until they couldn't stand and 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 produce something uh, unbelievable. It's not like today is a little different when you produce stuff. That was a different era. Uh, they used to do it on the two-inch tape. You know, it wasn't done uh, with the computer age and stuff. Right. It was like you used to have to bounce tracks. And So I really got broken into the music industry and learning how to do that. But when you get into a cult, there's, there's a spiritual force uh, that we all are in. And, and uh, understanding that um, is where this what God or, or what, what my life has helped me understand is, uh, you know, we all have gifts. We, you know, I have a gift that I used for my own um, success as a drug dealer and, um, and, and, and just all the pain and things that I lived in, I didn't know I didn't have to. So, you know, I'm in this, in this time with this cult and uh, I had a girlfriend, um, that was a real hippie. Back then we were hippies, you know. Right. <laughs> hippies or drug dealers, one or the other, and I was a drug dealer. So uh, uh, after two years, I ran out of money, and um, you know, my family, uh, the boss's wife called me, because he was uh, not able to move anymore, and she said, you wanna come down to, uh, to Miami? I, I, got, I got, and I wasn't trying, I was trying not to go anymore. I was trying not to be involved. Uh, and, and Barry, which was my driver, was he was in Colombia. He'd spent a lot of time in Colombia. Uh, and so I would have had to go get it. And, you know, I had long hair. And, you know, it was like a, a rock, you know, kind of rock star, you know, right. velvet, sports jacket, top hat, you know, uh, you know, very uh, exotic kind of person at the time. You stuck out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And not afraid to. And that was very... Uh, uh, a side of my personality that uh, uh, I'm kind of glad that's not there anymore because it wasn't balanced with with you know being socially acceptable. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna say that I'm sure the coke helped. Well, it did. It did. It certainly uh, uh, gave me that uh, uh, euphoric uh, that is not grounded for uh, for reality. I'll yeah. put it that way. That confidence to stand out yeah. and not be yeah. self. Uh, yeah. Um, concerned at all yeah i i get it so yeah. did you go down there what happened uh well uh so i uh, uh right right before um i left and and you know i was trying to decide what side am i on am i, am I gonna try to be on a side of life that uh, was um um how would i say uh appreciated people uh, in a different way that you are when you do when you're a rock star and that how uh, how the sex industry and how the music is promoted and how dramatic and how many people get hurt along the way and how people get used and abused and and I had to make a decision am I going to be over here with with him and and go for this thing uh, you know we had a, a a song called Universal Party and uh 
it, it was a momentum. It's a piece that could move a lot of people in a direction. So I, I wanted to do. I, am I going to be on this dark side and and be a drug dealer? And what is my life all about? Why why was God? Why did God or whatever power let me get this far? I was trying to figure out what it, you know being in the uh, psych ward and all the things I experienced, the pain I was still carrying. What, what does it all mean? And we all get to this point in life, uh, and and so. Right before I left, I, I prayed, the first time I ever prayed to, to God. I said, God, I said, um, um, I can't stop. I, 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 something, I said, I can't stop. I can't, I, I got to quit this. My, I was saturated, you know, I had a deviated septum. I couldn't hardly drink anymore. You know, I was, uh, couldn't hardly do any coke anymore because my nose would bleed and it was just, the insanity of that life, and I, I had to make a decision, am I gonna stay here? And I prayed to God, I said, if, if you stop me, I'll turn my life over to you. So I went down to Miami um, and uh, you know, met his wife, and you know, they had all the mules, they, they had uh, probably six to eight people that they would pack up, so they, when, they, when you left Bolivia, they had a room you went through, and they asked me when I was in Bolivia, they would pay that lady to get you to through to Miami, and then when you went through customs, they already had that set up. Who was going through? So they that's how it, that's how it works. And then the government get paid, and everybody gets paid. But they 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 got that group through and met me, and uh, you know the the people got a room, I got a room, and then all the mules came to the room and unloaded their stuff. It was all wrapped in bags and crust, and they had it on them all different ways. And so I left. Uh, Miami coming back um, and you know it was a out of all the years I ever did cocaine that was the best batch the last batch was the best batch and so uh, I got out of Miami and came to uh, got in Woodbine which is the first uh, right in Georgia so got over the line and um, by three o'clock in the morning you know I had a Cadillac hat on you know all that got pulled over and uh, and my girlfriend was with me um, and they put me in the back of that police car, and I said, I'm yours. So that was my surrender. To well, why did they pull you over? Uh, I think, I don't know who set me up. I don't know if it was, I, I met the guy from Cuba down there. Uh, I don't know, the sheriff would never tell me. We're still friends, I talked to him a month ago. Right. He won't tell me. <laughs> He, he won't tell me. He's ex-FBI. He he did F, He was the FBI agent for, like, he worked under J. Edgar Hoover. He worked for, I think, 15 years before he came sheriff. I mean, he had some power in, 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 in that town. And so somebody gave him the, what, just somebody said, pull this car well, or search uh, the car? Well, in Woodbine, or? Georgia, it was the first state, first town out. He, he, uh, he had, uh, uh, that was where they would set people up uh, coming out of Florida. That was their... The connection, the FBI connection, and all the snitches and all that stuff. That was the town you got pulled over. So there was ten other people in there from you know coming that way. That was cocaine corridor, and uh, so I got pulled over. Uh, they you know popped the trunk. I was had it hid behind the um, where the the spare tire was. There was a compartment. I had it in there, and I, it was in the back of the car. I said I'm yours. So that's where my new life really started. I had a choice. I could do it. I could stay in that confusion, or I said, "Okay, if this is what you're going to do, uh, I'm I'm yours." So it was um, the first week I was there. The D E uh, G B I in Georgia came to me and said, "Okay, you you're going to do some big times, so, you know." And uh, I I I wasn't, and uh, they they said, "If you we're going to put you out on 95, and you call your people and tell them you broke down, and you got to come." So that I said. And I wasn't, I didn't cooperate with him. I was oh. still kind of uh, oh. out of my uh, mind. You know, I was kind of out there, to tell you the truth. Right. I was very, very, you know, you do that much drugs and you're that high for so long, your, your, your reality thinking isn't too good. Right. So, you know, I was still a rock star. I was still a rock star right. back then, you know. But I knew I had to make a change. You know, I had to, I had to, uh, and so that's where uh, this crazy uh, new part of my life started. And uh, so the GBI came and they didn't, and then I, I got a lawyer and uh, my girlfriend wanted to, uh, uh, they arrested her and, uh, and 
I said, the only way I can get her out, everybody there got arrested with the girlfriend and the guys all blamed the girlfriend. So none of them were guilty. <laughs> No, no, I'm guilty. You found what in the car? Baby, what did you have in the car? <laughs> they were all, uh, 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 so they had, they had a, uh, uh, you know, the sheriff was, he had a hit on him. He was resting. He confiscated, uh, when I was there, uh, $18 million off the uh, 95. Wow. And he started, uh, and I'll, this is a little further down, but he started getting people going to Florida. So they had all the informants in the towns telling them what was coming and he started getting the money before it went to florida instead of after right and that's a whole another little piece of which the is story. really the way they, they would prefer it right? well not the judges and lawyers no but. but but yeah that that's where this thing gets real crazy uh but um so uh, uh was interstate transportation uh i got charged with i got 35 years that's what they gave me and, in uh, Georgia or just in Georgia, in, in, in Georgia? In, well, it was interstate transportation, but I got arrested in Georgia. Right. Okay. So, so it was federal. Federal. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, it was about three months, and I had three months before my court, before they took me into court, and, and uh, got a lawyer, and uh, they pleaded for eight, and uh, but before that, I had to sign the papers saying I was guilty to get my girlfriend out, right. uh, and I was trying to save my house, trying to save the recording studio. And um, so she went back and I signed papers. And I said, I'm guilty, I'm not gonna. So on the way back from court, and I, I had spaghetti legs, you know, that was before I pleaded, they gave me 35. And I could hardly walk up, the courthouse is 100 yards from the jail. And I was walking back there and I said, man, what did I do? I did it, uh, you know, what's gonna happen to me? You know, I got 35 years and my parents, nobody would, my parents, my mother wouldn't even talk to me. Nobody's gonna, they said, oh, it's good for you to be in jail. Cause I drove everybody, you know, I was insane and the family suffered. You right. know, the family suffers through our insanity. Yeah. And, and so they, they my sister, oh, it's the best thing in the world for him. He'll finally get his life. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what jail's like or being incarcerated. But anyway, walking back to the uh, uh, to jail, uh, there's a little um, area when you walk into the jailhouse, and it was a brand new jail because the sheriff has been built the courthouse. He built the new jail with money he was taking off of '95, and uh, the sheriff came and he, unbelievable character. He he uh, he you know had a big draw accent. He said, uh, it's, but my girlfriend pleaded that he would talk to me after court, so she she gave him a flower, put a card on his got the, the you know so he after jail he said okay i'll talk to him when he gets after court so he pulled me in his office and he says son are you guilty i said yes sir he says you know you're the first guilty person that's ever been in my jail <laughs> <laughs> and that's how our friendship started and they had he says listen i might be able to get you uh, a little better on your parole we're doing a, a thing saying uh, say no to drugs and that was ronnie reagan's right and i said yes sir oh so you were under the old law this was before uh um 1986 right I, it was uh actually 1980 the beginning that's when i got arrested in 86. okay so were you under the old law or i don't the, know i don't know what you, well, was there was parole parole was an option like you you, you could get parole you could get parole uh, okay but well. you know they were still paroling you know i but um you know i had two and a half keys in the trunk when i got pulled over so I, 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 you know, said I'm guilty, and then they gave me the 35 year sentence. Um, but when I told him that, yeah, I, I was guilty, he says, "Listen, I'm going to let you do some testimonies with me. I'm, uh, it's election year, and um, I need somebody to go out and explain what it is to, you know, go through your drug addiction and stuff." So I said, "Thank you, Lord." I didn't know the Lord then. I didn't know anything about God. Right. But I did surrender to Him, and uh, and that was my first hope that was something you know i was like crushed with that 35 year sentence and then that gave me a little hope that somebody something possibly could you know this guy's gonna let me work with him right so the the first uh, uh first time i did a testimony for him was in a grade school and that's what i have these shackles that's that, these are my shackles from right. that time i did that uh, I, I always like to pull them out because it kind of rem i remember what what life was back then you right know? and, and th this was uh i was you know shackled legs arms hands and then and then that that was put me in front of a grade school and and it really let me see of the bondage 
I was in. You know, it, we, we look at the, the physical, but the spiritual is where the bondage is. Nobody's, you know, we're all, you know, what is freedom? And so this is really my first step in, in that right, that direction. But like I said, uh, when I do share about my life as uh, what happened, I bring those out and, and really helps me to connect. That's who I used to be, bound right. and not free and not ashamed of who I was. I'm not ashamed anymore. Right. You know, I, I'm an ex-con. I know it. But, but God is doing something with my life. You know, so that's where it started. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was uh, out doing a, a talk with him, and he was, in, you know, in a suit, and he rubbed against the chalkboard. And when I was walking out with him, I grabbed his arm, and I, you know, you don't touch anybody like that. Right. Know? And I rubbed off the chalk that was on his suit, and that's where our bond, our friendship really started. I, I, and he started trusting me. And um, then uh, it's amazing thing happened. I, got a, I became a trustee in the kitchen. That was a big step, getting from, from yellow, uh, from, from the orange suits into the white suits, and right. I had a privilege to going down. And so I did flooring. So I said, you know, uh, they just did a brand new kitchen and they had no flooring in it. And I said, well, let me do, let me put some flooring in here for you guys. So I uh, ordered some flooring from Maryland. They shipped it down. I put the flooring in and I, I, I just uh, uh, built cabinets for the, uh, the library in the, in the jail. And then uh, I started, he started picking me up and I started going with him to, uh, so what was illegal? When he picked me up, he took me to uh, Charleston. That's where his family lived. And it was against the law to go out of state. And I'd say it now, but I wouldn't. Yeah. So uh, he would take me there. I would drive. He couldn't drive good. So he had a bad hip. He needed a hip replacement. And I would drive him. And we became best friends. I started, I probably went, I was out of the jail probably three or four days a week r riding around with him. He took me fish. He took me everywhere. Right. I mean, it was just like uh, <laughs> insanity. And, and that was, uh, and then uh, after I, I probably did uh, 15 testimonies to little churches, uh, community groups, and just telling them um, what was going on. And I started going to church. And, um, and, and I didn't, like I said, I didn't know God, but um, everybody, there is a God, if you don't believe or not, but there is. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've learned the difference between the dark and the light. So that's that's where God is using me. I understand what that is. I lived in it and and uh, and I started walking a new way. Now, did my drug habit? I hadn't gotten out of jail yet, but but my drug habit was did I, I smoke pot in jail? You know, I tried to get people to send me stuff. The cravings I had just didn't disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, of my lifestyle, but um, I wanted to do the right thing. So uh, after doing those testimonies, and you know, I said, I said, can you guys get me out of here? The guy that started taking me to church, his uncle was Bill uh, Jim Proctor. He's the sheriff of Woodbine, Georgia, right now. He, so he he was the guy that I started communication with. He took me to church with him, his family, and um, they kind of his mom on Christmas brought me to his house. They gave me Christmas presents. They let me. Uh, I, I was in the kitchen making gravy with his mom. I mean, I, I found out they didn't judge me. That was where I found out, I just said, God's love. They loved me like nobody ever did. And it gave me faith that there's hope for me. And that's where my life really started, just from that experience of people that uh, showed me that I had value and stopped judging me because of what I did and, and, and gave me a chance to be a new person. And that's where my walk really started. And so his uncle was the judge. They, the Bill Smith and him went to his uncle and said, can we get you out of here? In 18 months, I was out. I never, the, the state penitentiary tried to take me to prison. They wouldn't, they, the sheriff said, ah, they're not, I'm not gonna let them take you out. You're in my pro, you're in the drug program. And this is in, so the sheriff is running a drug program for the feds? Well, say no to drugs. Oh, okay. Uh, um, so that, that, that was a big thing. Uh, uh, you know, he got in touch later with Janet Reno. Uh, it went right up to the, uh, that was uh, Bill Clinton's uh, person. We started. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, she was the U.S. attorney um, for yeah, Bill Clinton. Yeah, after I got out, I went back to Woodbine and, and uh, work with uh, about 12 churches and the jail that have started going to the jail ministry there. Um, and he got permission. He spent uh, almost 400000 to send people 
to go to Saddleback Church to get uh, recovery ministry leaders that we, we, you know, so that was my first big step. So how much time did you spend in prison? 18 months. 18 months on a 30, on a 36 year sentence. 35 years. 35 year sentence. Yeah. That's yeah. insane. I, 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 what can I say? I can't, I, you know, I've seen people uh, for uh, a couple grams yeah, do five years. I was going to say, I've seen guys, you know, they'll bring a a gun to a $10 crack deal and get 15 yep. years, you know? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's pretty unbelievable. Yeah. I was going to say, did you, were you on pro parole? I was on parole. Okay. And, and, and um, uh, when I got out, I, I got my girlfriend. I went back to Georgia. I still wasn't talking to anybody in my family. And I got married. The sheriff gave my wife to me, and the guard gave my wife. It was a little town. You can imagine this is pretty wild. <laughs> and that's where I, you know, because I, I kind of disconnected from my family because I didn't know how to deal with that. My mother's still an alcoholic. You know, you know, I was the bad guy. You know, and it took me two years to gain uh, to see if this was the real deal. Nobody trusted me for the first two years. You know, all the guys were waiting for me to come out of retirement right. and go back to the old life. And so well, so what did you do when you got out? Uh, you, work, you know, I got work? a job uh, with a neighbor um, uh, for $8 an hour as a laborer in a construction company. And I was the happiest I ever, I'm used to walking around with a briefcase full of money. Right. But I was, uh, I was, had no worries. I didn't have that ton of bricks on my back and I wasn't gonna, you know, that was what I did. And, um, you know, I, I did, you re, after I got married, I went back down to Florida. I had Barry, I sent some a product down to Barry because I had another place in Fort Lauderdale that I still had a little a hideout. And um, I sent some product down there and I said, oh, I'm gonna get high one more time. And uh, I got high and, and I realized I'm not that person anymore. And um, I was miserable. And I said, I'll never go back. And, and that, was, that was the turning point um, that this new person I was becoming was real. And, and, um, and I wanted God to use me in a new way. Um, I found some peace that I never had. And, you know, all the pain and uh, abuse and all that, um, you know, that wasn't part of my life anymore. So that's where it started. And then um, I came back, got a, uh, got a job uh, working in a flooring company. Um, after I did construction, uh, the guy that sent me that tile that I did to jail, right. I did flooring for a little bit before I got, I was dealing, but I still had a job. Right. I, I had a flooring company called Horizon Floors. Um, and I was still dealing, it was drugs and rugs at that time. <laughs> but uh, went back and he had a big company, uh, a Jewish man that was really uh, a mentor kind of teaching me business and, and learning how to do business to be successful in the system instead of the way I was. You know, I had a talent, but I wasn't doing it right. legally. So I did that for uh, about three years, and he wanted me to come on uh, staff uh, and salary. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I was 26,000 in debt. Uh, the house I had, had, you know, the drywall fell, had holes in the roof, and, uh, you know, just building my trust up with my family. It took about two years, and then I became the walking miracle. And my mom worked out a deal that I could have the property, because I was the youngest, and my sisters had moved. Um, and that would be an inheritance that she gave my sisters so much, and, and then that would be my inheritance. So I had a piece of property, uh, just did two years with Bert, and I said, well, I'm going to open my own flooring company. So I, I, I paid off. I paid off all my debt. I paid my mom the twenty six thousand, uh, and then um, had nobody after me. Um, uh, and then I got involved in a little flooring company, and it, it was. Uh, I saved up twenty six thousand. I went to the bank and asked them to match it. Got a, uh, one of the jobs I got. Uh, that another Jewish friend of mine. Uh, was going to do a big project, 26, 000, 20, 120, 46 uh, townhomes, and he awarded me the job. So I went to the bank, borrowed money, and that was the start of uh, uh, Craftmaster Interiors. So me and my wife started that company. Um, I, I had this piece of property, it was four acres. We started working on sub, subdividing that, 
And then we opened up a company in D.C. I had uh, Craft Masters of D.C. and Craft Masters of Maryland. Had about, uh, my, uh, that was, that went on for 18 years or, or 10 years. And then she got in an accident. Um, um, she gave her life to the Lord, but she didn't quit using. And she started drinking and doing, got in a car accident and started doing Oxycontin. And that was, uh, that was the real turning point of her downfall. And uh, she had a lot of resentments of family. She had a rough abuse of things when she was young and could never forgive the people and all that that went through it. Uh, her, her drug addiction got uh, hard. It was the roughest. We were married 18 years. That was the roughest. I wouldn't give up on her, but it was the roughest thing. We were, she's a brilliant business person. Um, like I said, we had the two companies, uh, the right as she got that accident and we started really having problems and she was overdosing. I was running her to the hospital about every three months. Uh, you know, it was just, it was, you know, it, it's kind of what I put everybody through. Now I was trying to, I had to go through that with her and I didn't give up on her, but uh, she passed. I, uh, after a big job in DC, we went on a, a cruise to St. Martin's and she passed away on a ship. She uh, overdosed. Uh, her body just gave out. She died down in the sick bay. So that was. Uh, um, How long ago was this? That was in 2009. She passed away. Okay. Or 2008 or nine. I'm not sure exactly. Um, you know, I had a. a um, I was doing a whole city block of buildings uh, from Davis Construction. Uh, you know, I was doing about a six million dollar job. Had about 30 guys working. Um, pretty successful. Uh, she was doing all the taxes. I was still not learning how to read and write very good, so right. I was trusting her uh, to do the business. Um, but when she passed, um, you know, I continued, but I always had this vision. God really touched me about helping guys, especially incarceration, guys, uh, reentry. That's my heart. I think right. I mentioned that to you. Um, you know, like I said, there's so many gifted guys in, ba in bars that if they don't get it, if they don't realize they got to get it right, they're always going to be there. Right. And, and you've taken what you've been through and, and used your personality and your gifts to do what you're doing now, which is unbelievable. But, but for me, God said, um, I want you, you know, he, he's, you know, I have tremendous blessing with the Lord, um, meaning he's uh, let me develop a, a way to help men with addiction. Uh, and I, I took, um, although I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, you know, after she passed, uh, I, I had the business and really felt God calling me to find a piece of property to open up a recovery center. And, um, and so that's where my heart was. And I gave, really gave the company and put it in, in my secretary's hands. And I had three people in the office and I w hired a new uh, tax accountant because, uh, you know, I, I never filed anything. My wife did it all and I was kind of scared it might right. fall apart. So found a, a lady I was doing recovery with at a church, uh, celebrate recovery at the time. Um, and that's what the sheriff helped me do with back in Woodbine and send everybody there. So and got involved with Chuck Colson and some very big ministries. But because of me being my ex uh, con, I really didn't get they kind of shut the door on me. You know, doors didn't open for me. Right. It's like unless you've been there, sometimes people don't understand what that's all about. Right. And, uh, Chuck it's kind Colson, of a good old boys club. Yeah. It's like opening a halfway house. Like, yeah. It's it's you know, you know it's like it's like federal judges and yeah. like it's hard to open a halfway house. You would yeah. think that they'd want as many yeah. open as possible. Yeah, yeah. So when when I uh, I started at when I did celebrate recovery, I went to a jail and I did uh, went every Saturday for eight eight years, and really you know it, it broke my heart when a guy his time's up and he I said where are you going? He says well I'll be back here because this is where I, you know they get used to the system instead yeah. of learning they can do it outside and there's nobody a lot of churches come in and tell them about God but they they need an experience they don't need somebody telling them they need to be shown this can be real and and that's really what God has done with my life is saying this can be real you can get it right um, and I, it's a way that God has showed me that works and uh, so um, 
after being in there and working with guys for about eight years, just realized I had to do something to get them a place to come and, um, and have a chance to start over. Right. And so it took me about 10 years to find a place. It was a God story of, uh, of, of what that was. It was really uh, um, hard to get the money. And so I sold everything I had. Me and my got married again. Me and my wife sold everything we had. I had two houses, uh, you know, I had a couple of Mercedes. Uh, uh, she had a townhouse and, and then I was searching for property and we bought 16 acres in Woodbine, uh, Woodbine Maryland. And then it used to be an old French restaurant and it was a sanitarium for that, for women. It, it housed 26 women. Okay. And then somebody turned it into a French restaurant. On 16 acres? You don't need 16 acres for that. It's, it's just a beautiful, it's just a really beautiful, it's in the country, countryside. Right, okay. You know, it's really a beautiful uh, piece of property. And was it was built, say, built in 1862. I was going to say, you could put all of those two businesses on one acre. Yeah. So you just, so yeah. it, you just got a whole bunch of acreage also. Yeah. yeah, and I was trying to get something not close to anybody because, you know, when you bring people in with addiction. Yeah, or of course, the, the neighbors the, get the upset. Na- yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like everybody, everybody yeah. wants halfway houses and they want yeah. rehabilitation. Yeah. They just don't want it in their neighborhood. Right. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I did it very slowly. And uh, the first uh, the first not even eight months. Um, so the IRS calls me. And uh, I get one when they shut one business count down, it was forty six thousand. And I, I said, what, nobody, what are you doing? What are you doing? And, and, and I had a big tax firm, big money. I paid them a lot of money. And um, in, in a month's time, I had $500,000, and I just spent every cent that I had on this property. Right. And, and I, I said, oh, my goodness, I'm going to lose everything. I thought everything was going to collapse. So I learned how to uh, go through a really hard time. I, I fired the— So, okay, so— you. The IRS showed up for what reason? You hadn't been paid. The, the yeah, it company was a year. You had the girls in the office that I trusted, and the new tax firm. They didn't give them all the information. I just did these big, huge projects, and and the money that I spent was money that should have been spent for taxes. Okay. And I didn't. Nobody told me that's what it was, and I was trusting the girls that my wife, my first wife taught and they were putting the letters and the stuff for the IRS in a pile and I didn't get it until I got pulled aside okay so my office that I didn't run I thought was doing a good job right got wasn't. me right. wasn't and I spent the money I should have been spending on taxes I sold a house I thought this was all profit and and I had this big firm that I, I, I hired to say you make sure you do this tax work with them so I don't get in trouble and they didn't do that either. All right. So I had to work my way out of that five hundred thousand. I still had the company open, the flooring company. Right. But that was uh, that was uh, in the in the Bible. It says, you know, moving mountains. You know, God does move mountains because he. There's a reason he let me experience all this, and he got me through that too. And I I, I started working, got a couple jobs, and I, I fired the tax uh, accountants, and I went right in with this little country uh, accountant. And, uh, um, you know, went and visited the IRS myself. I said, I'm, you know, I was kind of fearful, but I said, yeah. I'm just going to, these guys are getting me in more trouble. I yeah. had a $50,000 uh, bill from the tax company that I hired to keep me from paying taxes. And I said, I'm not going to do this. Right. I'll just do it myself. So I worked through that, got all my bills paid. I've got, got that 500. I went and negotiated every bill. It probably came down to about 300, but I got it all done. Right. You negotiate with the IRS yeah. for, for the debt. Yeah, you're never getting the five hundred. You may get three hundred, <laughs> but you'll never get five. Yeah. yeah, so that that worked out, and uh, so that's been twelve years uh, that I've got the property and, and building the ministry or or second chance center, um, and and now I'm really at a point where uh, you know I've been very under the radar with what we do, and 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 um, you know. Uh, just trying to, I want to build a, 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 a place for guys to learn trades. Also, I've got a, 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 com- a construction company. I've got a culinary chef. Uh, there's a, uh, I just remodeled a kitchen in the building so guys could learn culinary school. Uh, and also a fire alarm company. I've got three, three ways to teach them a new trade if they, want, if they want to learn a new trade and a new way to live. So that's taken 12 years uh, 
to get it to where a guy could have a chance to have a new life. And, and re-entry, um, there's a Kairos ministry that goes into jails and they spend a weekend uh, working with guys. Uh, and they just, because of the pandemic, they haven't been letting them go back in. And right. they're, they're doing that and I'm gonna work with them. I'm gonna keep at least four beds open for guys that are in prison that want it, really want it, because everybody talks about it, but it, you know, you gotta really want it to, it to make it work. Well, how many guys do you have right, right now? Right now I got uh, 10 guys and it kind of alternates. Eight is what I'm capable because a couple guys will leave or whatever. Right. And I'm rezoning to get a, hopefully 16 to 20 guys. That's the, I've rebuilt the property from A to Z. Um, you know, right now that's what we're doing is rezoning. Uh, and I had to build um, kind of a following and, and, and right now um, we have about ninety-five thousand dollars a year from just people sending money in because I I've never I haven't gotten paid for twelve years. My wife doesn't get paid. I just do this because of my heart. I don't. I'm not looking for money. I'm trying to build this for the next generation. Right. Because things are getting tough out here. So, so we're, right now we got ninety-five thousand a year to pay. I got two young men. Uh, one of them's been through the program. Uh, I've got to raise up about at least one hundred and fifty thousand a year in donations to meet the $400,000 a year bill it costs to keep the property open. Okay. And somehow, it's always, it's somehow God keeps sending people to help. And, and, and this connection of coming here to talk to you has been quite unique. Yeah, I was gonna say the guy that contacted me had been through the program. He is a graduate, yeah. yeah. Yep, and uh, you know, I'm not a social media guy. I, I'd rather be in the back of the, the building, even with church, I, I wanna be in the back. I don't wanna be up front. But, right. So me talking is, uh, um, you know, I'm just trying to figure out a way to give some guys another chance. Okay. So, uh, how are you? Are you? You feel you good? Are I'm. We? I'm really good. I mean, I, mean, uh, I think uh, you know. Uh, and then you know the book we have, and right. uh, I got another book I'm doing. Um, um, Colby will put it uh, in the description box, yeah. right? So um, I think it's on Amazon. I think you can get it on Amazon if somebody wants it. And, yeah, I'm um, sure it's you on. Know, like I said, working on another. Everything's on Amazon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so just so you know, that, that, that's a picture of my grandfather. That's the guy that. Uh, okay. He was a pretty uh, gangster guy. And, if like, you can send all these. Yeah. I can, I, if you can send all these. Things. Barry Seal. The Barry that my oh, buddy's okay. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think uh, last time I talked to him it was about eight months ago, and uh, he has always been in touch. He's a sweetheart of a guy, just a sincere, a guy that would die for you. That that was the guys that I work with. That's guy uh, Dale. Uh, my little family was uh, a tough little family, you know. That's how I put around me to keep from making sure I didn't go down before I surrendered, if you want to call it that. So. Is there anything else that I, anything I didn't ask? Uh, I think that's, uh, you know, I have an unbelievable wife now. Uh, that's, uh, it's been a huge uh, part, you know. Uh, I'm a faith-based program. Um, you know, I don't push anything on anybody. Uh, I respect other people, but uh, it, was, it was my ticket to a new life. Right. And, and that's really, um, you know, I know Jesus Christ. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a preacher, but I know what he did for me and how my life changed. So that's really, um, you know, what I'm, and I, I, like I said, you know, I appreciate what, you, what God has done with you. One way or the other, he's right. using you to help people. And that's huge, you know, that's a, that's a blessing. So. All right. Did it, did you are you good? Did I do okay? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just want to I just wanted to make sure that you know. Yeah. I didn't miss anything. No, I think that's pretty I tend much to miss the. Things. Yeah, I think that's a uh, uh, pretty much lay. There's a lot of detail I didn't, uh, you know, but I didn't want to waste your time or you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you for. Thank yeah. you for coming out. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching the video. If you like the if you like the the interview, do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Also share the video because that really does help. You know, hit the like button and uh, leave a comment in the comment section. Also, uh, we're gonna have the book. Uh, it's gonna be in the description, so you can hit the link and buy the book. And I really appreciate you guys watching uh, the video. So thanks for checking in and see ya.